Well, thank you for having me along here today. And I must admit, I looked out there when I came in. First of all, I thought, this is fantastic, an afternoon at the races. But I've looked up Gawla, and it's not till the 2nd of October the next race is here. So I've got to hang around for a fair while to take advantage of that beautiful landscape out there and to actually have a bet on the races. But anyway, we're not here to talk about the races. I, I do want to talk about a few things, and I'll talk about... Dubbo and New South Wales. And I apologise for that. Obviously, it's a South Australian crowd in front of me, but I think generally we can interchange some of those. There might be some subtle differences there, but hopefully the message I'll have there for you will be something that you can translate into South Australia and use essentially in regional areas across the state. But before I do that, I want to talk about some movie misquotes. It's one of my bugbears when people don't get things accurate. And I don't want to get you to answer questions or yell out answers. I haven't got any prizes here to give you. I just want you to think about some of these as I flip through some of these. The first one that probably everyone knows is play it against Sam. Nowhere in Casablanca do they say play it against Sam. And just, again, have a think amongst yourselves what you think it might be. But it's one of those things that everyone knows. Oh, yes, they know that that's not in the movie, but you, you can't always think about what the real one is. And, of course, you've got to struggle to look through it about where they're talking about. But the closest I can find there was what Humphrey Bogart says, if you can stand it, I can play it, which is not quite play it against Sam. The next one that I find interesting that most people aren't aware of is mirror, mirror on the wall. Surely that's an accurate movie quote. But again, have a think amongst yourselves what it might be. But in the original Snow White, I'm going back to the 1930s now, they actually said magic mirror on the wall. Subtle difference, I know, but it just annoys me that people don't get things accurate. The third thing I want to mention is, do you feel lucky, punk? Dirty Harry, Clint Eastwood. And again, how many people have said something like that? They might be mucking around with each other and they'll quote something along those lines. But of course, he never says that in the movie. He's got it a bit more um, elaborate in what he says. And he goes through that whole process, you know, do I feel lucky? Well, do you punk is a bit different. And the reason I said that, it was actually perfect for the last speaker who actually gave me a segue. I didn't even ask him to do it for me, but he's given me a perfect segue because one of the things that I hear mentioned so often and I do wonder what happened before 1989, because this movie came out in 1989. But a common thing that I hear so often is a strategy is to build it and they will come. And that's exactly what the last speaker said a minute ago. I'm sorry to have a go at anyone here, but, but it was perfect timing for him. Build it and they will come. Now, there's a couple of issues I've got with this. The first issue I've got with this is it's number five on the all-time list of movie misquotes. <laughs> Kevin Costner, his dad, the ghost, nowhere in that movie do they say, build it and they will come. It's a subtle difference, but it's an important difference. In the movie, when Kevin Costner's walking through the field, his dad whispers to him and says, if you build it, he will come. So all these things that people keep saying they're going to build and they will come, if they were true to the movie, one person would come. So what's the point of building this whole great big thing if you're going to get one person come along? Now, I suppose the thing that gets me with that as well is apart from the fact it's quoted incorrectly, and I do wonder, as I said before, 989, what did councils, what did government say? Were they going to build something? No one would know that quote to say it before then. But the thing is that when people have done that, and the best example I can think of is the Wagner family in Toowoomba who spent $100 million on their legacy, their Wellcamp Airport, and they are still having to subsidise flights to get any airline, freight or passengers to fly into Toowoomba. So they had $100 million spare. That's fine. I don't know many local government or other regional organisations that have $100 million spare to blow on something. But it really seems to me that build it and they will come is not a strategy. It's just a prayer. And I'm interested to see how the Wellcamp Air Airport finishes up there. But... I don't know lots of great examples of where that will come. So if that's not going to be the solution, and don't get me wrong, if Chris McMahon comes along and says, we've got lots of millions of dollars for regional areas, I'll take it, but I don't know that's the solution. What I do want to look at is what I think is the solution. So what's the impediment? What is the reason? What's the number one reason that regional areas are not growing? Now, again, I don't want you to yell it out here. I hate when you go to a conference and people expect you to participate. You just want to sit there and listen. You don't want to have to actually go and do things. So the number one thing that I think is plain and simple, and I'm being as polite as I can be to metro dwellers, any of that might be in the room, it's plain old-fashioned ignorance. Now, I'm not saying that metro dwellers are stupid. I'm saying they're ignorant to what regional areas have to offer. And there's a big difference. So I'm not trying to be completely insulting and saying that everyone in the city is, is stupid. But they don't know what is on offer 
in regional locations. They don't understand. Where I am, many people just assume that you're farmers. I cannot count the number of people that have met me in Dubbo. They might meet the mayor or they might meet me in some other context and they'll shake my soft little hands. They've never done a hard day's work in their lives. And they say, how much land have you got? And I go, well, you know, I, I've just got about 2,000 square metres. And you can see they're totally ignorant because they go, so what do you grow on that? And they go, well, I've been growing Kokuyu for a few years now. I am thinking about going to Buffalo, though. It seems a bit better in winter. And you can see the confused look on their face and they're thinking, I know Kokuyu and Buffalo. I wonder what he's talking about there. And finally I say, I live in town. I've got a little house block of 2,000 square metres with some grass. That's all I grow. They just assume that everyone in a regional area must be a farmer. Taxi drivers run a million miles when I land at Sydney Airport because I love using taxi drivers as my little survey, my little ground truth. So I'll jump in and I say, why are you stuck here in Sydney? What are you doing in Sydney? Why don't you come to a regional location, say, like Dubbo, for example? And so often they'll say, oh, well, I don't want to be a farmer. Or you haven't got jobs out there, have you? Or do you have taxis out there? So they just don't know. And when you break it down and actually put some facts around it, I'm going to give some employment stats here in a moment. But one of the things here, again, this will be specific to Dubbo and New South Wales, but I'm sure you can apply something similar. When you look at that there, our number one employer is health and social services. Number two is retail. That blows people away from Sydney thinking retail. How could that be the number two employer? What would you have in Dubbo. What shops would you possibly have in Dubbo? Why would anyone need retail? When you go down that list there, you don't go very far down the list yet to accommodation and food services. Now, if you look at that list there, you'll see that and I've got Dubbo versus New South Wales there. So Dubbo is the, the blue and New South Wales is the orange. You'll see that accommodation and food and retail are both higher in terms of our employment than New South Wales. So for someone in Sydney, it's easy for you to get your almond latte with soy milk and some other crazy thing you want to put in your coffee and go down to the retail shops in Dubbo than it is across the average of New South Wales. And even when you compare the stats to Sydney City Council, our accommodation, food and retail are higher than in the centre of Sydney. So it kind of changes their perception a little bit. But how do you do that? I'm doing it one taxi driver at a time. But I'm not sure that's going to really make a big difference to the population growth in regional New South Wales or, in fact, in Dubbo. So many years ago, 13 years ago, in fact, actually it was longer than that ago. It was before I was mayor, way back in 2006. I remember we started discussing this idea of putting some sort of collaborative marketing plan together to try and work out a way to convince people in Sydney that there was something outside Sydney that maybe would be attractive to them. So it took a few years for us to get it together. We got some government mon money out of it. And we got seven cities across the state to join in on this program. And we called it EVO Cities, which stood for absolutely nothing. EVO stands for nothing. It just sounded like a cool name. And we're going to have cities in it. So let's go with EVO Cities. It just had to be a name that was different, obviously. So we created that back in 2010, started the whole process. And purely and simply, this was a marketing campaign. It was designed to do nothing else but market regional cities. Now, again, I know I'm talking about cities here, but there are towns in New South Wales who are now doing something similar on a smaller scale, but it can apply to any group of cities. And I would do it as a group because the money that I can get to spend as a group is much more impressive than me as an individual town or city. And when I'm trying to spend money in Sydney, so in your example, trying to spend money in Adelaide, it's hard to get a lot of cut through when you've only got the budget of one town or one location, for example, combine that money, and that's what we did. So we put our money together, combined that with some government money. We ended up with about a million dollars of marketing funds with wasn't a lot of contribution from Dubbo. So we had about $50,000 contribution to get a million dollars worth of marketing. So we did it as a marketing campaign. We did some market research, first of all, and we found that people didn't want a tree change. They still had this idea that they'd go to a regional area, there'd be clods of dirt, and they'd have to come back to Sydney on a regular basis to do their supermarket shopping. We had, I went and did a talk to a group of GP registrars one time. This is a group, mind you, that has finished their medical degree. They've done their internship at least a year at a hospital. They've, they've actually spent two years in hospital after their medical degree. And then they're going out as a GP registrar. So they've got a few years and a bit of experience. And I talked to one group one time and I said, what's your first impression of Dubbo? And one guy said... I was pretty happy that I didn't need to use all the two-minute noodles that I brought with me because I found them in the supermarket. It's like, really? You didn't think you'd get two-minute noodles? 
I'm not going to you as a patient, definitely, <laughs> if that's the best you can come up with. So a lot of it was they wanted a city change. We did some AB marketing, for example, and we found that when we put pictures of coffee shops, restaurants, main streets, the click-through rate was quite good. When we put pictures of open paddocks, lovely race courses, for example, open air, things that you might think are attractive in regional areas, we didn't get a very good click-through. People in Sydney want to know they can still get a meal or have a coffee or go to the cinema, something that they can do in Sydney, but maybe do it in a slightly better way. So that was a really important part, getting that. We did, as I said there, the, the images of modern cities, and we really focused on the negative. Now, it sounds bad to focus on the negative, but when I say negative, it was the pain factor. What are the things that are painful about living in Sydney, in our example? What are the things that really annoy and frustrate people? Let's focus on that and show people we've got a solution. So we didn't show pictures of beaches because we didn't really think we could compete with Sydney on beaches, but we definitely could compete on some other areas. And then it was all about educating the metro dwellers. So how do we do that? I'll show you a couple of little ad, static ad campaigns, a little video in a moment, to show you the, some of the ways we did that. And again, it's fairly simple marketing, but really about focusing on those pain points. So on motorways where people would spend 40 minutes to an hour on their way to work each day, we put billboards up that showed a picture of a congested city, as you can see there, versus a very open regional area. And again, pretty simple, goodbye peak hour. It doesn't say too much, it just says enough for people to go, What's that about? What we did find, and actually no, I'll show you when I do the employment, I'll talk about that when I do the employment. We put it on the back of buses, just to show that congestion there. We put it at railway stations, because you don't need to catch a train to get to work in Dubbo. You can just walk if you want, or drive a car. So that's pretty simple. And then in other areas, so Western Sydney at the time was having some huge housing stress for people not being able to get into their houses for anything that was a, vaguely affordable for anything bigger than an outhouse, I think, and show them the alternatives they might have out in regional areas. And I'll show you a little ad we ran as well. This is just a little video, which hopefully sounds better. I didn't design it, so thanks very much for the clap. <laughs> but again, pretty simple, pretty simple graphics, just really capturing the pain point there. So what we found when we actually got the stage of people moving, it had an impact, but there was a lag. So let's show you the population graph of Dubbo, for example, versus New South Wales. So that's the annual population growth year by year over the last 10 years. Now again, the orange, which starts off on top, is New South Wales, so it's going along, bouncing around between about 1.1 and 1.5%. You'll see Dubbo down as low as, say, 0.7%, started to pick up, and I'll get to the pandemic in a minute, because the pandemic was positive for regional areas in New South Wales, but what we found was all the marketing we were doing was taking at least a year to actually come to fruition, because when someone finally, on the way, on the motorway, or at a train station, they finally go, ah, I'm over this, I've got to get out of this place. From that time that they make up their mind, we found it was a minimum of 12 months to two years to actually make the move. Because the first thing they had to do was like, oh, I'm sick of this, I need money, I need a job. Right, I'll go and look for a job. So they need to find a job. Then they need to find a house. Then they might have had kids or a partner. What's their partner going to do? The kids might need to get into schools, they might finish the school year. So it's a fairly long lead time from the time that you make the decision to the time you actually finally make the move. What we did create out of this was another website called Evo Jobs because our survey showed that about 94% of people that made the move waited till they found a job before they made a move. Makes sense, I want to be able to afford to live in Dubbo, I need to actually have a job. So let's make it easier for them. So we created Evo Jobs, which was a, a website that people could put jobs on, 
employers could put jobs on and then people could be attracted to those jobs. So that made it a little bit better because it made it easier to get those jobs. Now the pandemic in regional New South Wales, I'm sure the same in regional South Australia, these geniuses in Sydney finally worked out that they didn't need to commute an hour to work each day. They could stay at home and do the same job. They had a computer, had a phone. But then they realised it didn't matter whether they were a one hour commute from work or a five hour commute from work because they're sitting at home. So suddenly people started moving to regional locations. Happy days, fantastic. That meant they could move out to areas like Dubbo. So we saw regional growth quite good. And I remember when I was looking through some data and I looked at that and I went, wow, I'm a bit surprised that we didn't see a bit more growth. But the next problem, which is a good problem to have, is then housing. So this is part of our problem across the nation. In 1911, 4.53 people per house on average. Now we're down to 2.54 people per house. So stop getting divorced people, it's terrible. <laughs> if you looked at that and your population didn't grow, you would need almost double the housing compared to what you would need with those different population stats. Now, people are having less children, people are getting divorced, people are choosing different options. So part of our problem was that more people were moving, we grabbed a bit of that movement earlier on and then when the pandemic hit, we just had not enough housing to accommodate them all. And we had the wrong type of housing. Look at that. We had all this housing for three and four bedrooms and all the demand was for one and two bedrooms. So great, we've got people moving here. We've started the momentum going fantastic. People are coming, they want to be in Dubbo. They've heard about this great mayor. They want to come out and meet him, all these wonderful things, but we haven't got enough housing. So then we've got to be innovative. And this is where I think regional locations absolutely are much more innovative and think much cleverer about a whole range of things. So we, that was my 20 minutes to go bell, was it? <laughs> that was just a random bell. <laughs> oh good, 30 minutes to go, excellent, yeah right. Um, so we, um, we thought we'd better get innovative. So in some future releases of land, we allocated specifically four blocks to start with that only a 3D printed house could be built on. Hmm, interesting. No one jumped at it. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't very popular at all. No one liked the idea at all. So we thought we've got to get people used to the idea. So we've just printed a 3D printed amenities block, a toilet block. It doesn't sound that exciting, I grant you that. But this here, you are looking here at the construction, it's finished now, but at the construction of the very first piece of public infrastructure built in this nation, built in Dubbo. Once people saw it, and you can see off to the side there, just on the, on the on your right hand side, some spectators there. I reckon if we, if we charged 10 bucks per spectator, we would have paid for this. The number of people who came along to look at this being printed, to look at it being built, quite incredible. Now that it's built, people are still going there. The motel across the road said, there's still people every day going and looking at this. Now people in Dubbo are going, oh, that's okay. That 3D printed toilet block looked okay. I can handle a house built like that. So now we'll get to the stage where we start doing some 3D printed housing. I've already talked to our housing minister in New South Wales. I've talked to Christy McBain about it as well and Catherine King, but more our housing minister in the state to say, maybe this is a bit of a solution for the housing crisis that we find ourselves in across the nation. Let's get houses printed quicker. My daughter happens to be an architect and she said, she, she works at Sydney University and she said her bosses, her superiors heard about this didn't know my daughter's from Dubbo, love the idea because architects are great at drawing nice curvy lines until a builder looks at it and says, how am I meant to build that? No better example than the Opera House. The design looked fantastic, but someone then had to build it and make it stand up. So with 3D printing, you can build basically whatever design you want. So I'll finish off with a quote that I've stolen that wasn't about regional cities, but I have stolen it ever so slightly. You may recognize this, but I think it applies to regional cities. To be twice as impressive, you, sorry, we must be twice impressive to be seen as half as good and luckily that's not very difficult for us to do. You recognise that quote? No, it was applied to females, there was a quote about females. <laughs> females, something along the lines of the same thing, that they need to be twice as impressive to be seen as half as good as a man, luckily that's not very difficult. <laughs> right, so thank you, I'm done with 40 seconds left on the clock. Thank you very much.